Hi, I'm Tom Long. Welcome to Island Meditations. This is the last week in the uh, liturgical calendar. It's the last week after Pentecost, so uh, this is the 27th Sunday after Pentecost. And uh, today we are standing on one of the town of Oak Island's little fishing docks that they provide for the locals. Uh, just a little place to park and walk out, out here on the dock and fish in this really beautiful setting. And today is just one of those great days where uh, there's clouds in the sky, but there's light coming through the clouds and they're reflecting beautifully. The clouds are reflecting beautifully off of the water. So as we open God's word and hear what it is that God might have to say to us, let's enjoy looking at these beautiful views that are provided to us by God's creation. Thank you for joining me. Let's walk and reflect on what it is God has to say to us today. Our reading for this week comes from the first chapter of the book of Apocalypse. Wait, what? You say there is no book of Apocalypse? Maybe you know it as the book of Revelation, but the Greek word for Revelation is Apocalypse. Why am I jumping in right away and going all word nerdy on you? <laughs> because for many people, this book is written in a completely unfamiliar literary form known as apocalyptic literature. As we prepare to close out the lectionary for calendar year B, I'll note that this is only the second time in the last two years that we have had a reading from the book of Revelation. However, in the upcoming year, year C, we will have six readings from Revelation during Eastertide, so it may be worth our time this week to lay a foundation of understanding the nature of apocalyptic literature. To John's first century audience, this literary form would have been quite familiar, as it was used in their scriptures, the Old Testament books of Joel, Zechariah, and parts of Isaiah. The best example would probably be the book of Daniel. In English literature, we tend to have poetry and prose. Probably the closest we come to apocalyptic literature would be the more fantastic of the genre of our fables. You see, apocalyptic literature is an unveiling of what had before been a mystery. Angels make an announcement or prophets have a vision, and these revelations tend to be very symbolic. If they are given an interpretation, even the interpretation is cryptic. Apocalyptic literature gives us the greatest scope for our imaginations when trying to ferret out the truth that is being symbolically revealed. Even narrative, unless very explicit, can yield different interpretations of what is being heard. Pastor Sang and I were talking after the service last Sunday about how on occasion someone will come up to us and tell us they appreciate the sermon we just preached on subject A when we had been under the impression that we were preaching on subject B. <laughs> but when one expresses oneself poetically, our audience is even more likely to come away with a broad range of understanding what it is that we have just said. Given the literary form that John chose for this final book in the New Testament, it shouldn't be surprising that the interpretations of this book have varied widely, not just among current students of the book, but by faithful readers through the ages. Considering the wide differences in the ways that theologians have understood this book, I thought this week would be a good opportunity to reflect on when to be dogmatic about my beliefs and when to hold my beliefs more lightly. In Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, God said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There are people who act like they know it all, but God says that God alone has this higher knowledge. But just because we can't know everything with certainty doesn't mean we can't know anything with certainty. Moses put it this way, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. We don't know everything with certainty, but God has revealed what we need to know to walk humbly and faithfully with our Lord. 
the book of Revelation is a wonderful opportunity to luxuriate in marrying our reason with our imagination as we seek to grow in our understanding of how to better walk with God. But the revelation of these mysteries is done in a way that what we think we understand should be humbly held as little more than our best effort to grasp higher knowledge, not God's final say-so. As we look at John's greeting to the churches in what Rome had designated as the province of Asia, modern Western Turkey, we are quickly exposed to a major characteristic of apocalyptic literature. In Revelation 1 verses 4 and 5, John says, John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Systematic theology has developed terminology to explain the mystery of the Trinity. We are monotheistic, believing only in one God. But that one is also three persons, traditionally described as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bar borrowing the phraseology Jesus used in his mandate for baptism. So we say things like, there are three persons in one Godhead. But here in Revelation, there is no attempt at tying this mystery up in a bow. John simply describes God as him who is and who was and who is to come. He describes Jesus as the one who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. It would be fair to ask for clarification of what John is trying to say about the Father and the Son, but where it really veers off into into the symbolic language of apocalyptic literature is when John describes for us the Holy Spirit. At least I think he's talking about the Holy Spirit. What he actually says is the seven spirits before his throne, or that could also be translated the sevenfold spirit before his throne. The number seven symbolized fullness or completeness, or it could be a reference to Isaiah 11 verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. See how God described the Spirit as being one, the Lord, two, wisdom, three, understanding, four, counsel, five, might, six, knowledge, and seven, fear of the Lord. And to make the water even more murky, some theologians interpret this as a reference to seven angels, based on an even more tenuous understanding of Zechariah. We could look at John's use of this apocalyptic literature as a frustrating failure to spell things out for us. But I'd rather look at it as an invitation to reflect on the rest of Scripture in the light of John's words and let my reason take flight on the wings of my imagination as I open myself to what the living God is saying to me, to us. I don't expect to land on foundational dogma and declare to all who will listen, Thus saith the Lord. But I want to be open to what God is saying to us. I want to be lifted up in worship and wonder at the mystery of the heights and depths of our faith. In that spirit, I look forward to spending more time in the book of Revelation next year. Lord, we thank you for the truths you have revealed to us, the theories that help us navigate our way through this life, and the mysteries that open us to a level of truth beyond our grasp. In humility and awe, may we trust in you to shepherd us on our paths until we meet again. Amen.